On behalf of Bombay First and the collaborating chambers, I'd like to welcome all of you for a very special evening that stars Dr. Tarun Ramadurai. Since I see several new faces here this evening, let me introduce Bombay First. Our corporate name is Bombay First and our brand name is Mumbai First. It was started in 1995 by Sushim Datta, who was the chairman of Hindustan Lever at that time, and the active support of Mr. Keshav Mahindra, Narendra Nair, Deepak Parekh, Ashok Advani, Nasir Munji, and Atul Choksi. The original sponsors were Asian Paints, State Bank, Sadorabji Tata Trust, Tata Power, Philips, HDFC, Mahindra and Mahindra, Saratan Tata Trust, Blue Star, Hindustan Unilever, and ICICI Bank. The most recent addition is Larsen and Tubro. If there's any volunteers from this audience who'd like to become patron members, we'll welcome you with open arms and a red carpet. Bombay First works across nine verticals, infrastructure, healthcare, education, affordable housing, environment, governance, smart city concept, and making Mumbai the financial center. The last mention will be of interest to our audience today. This was taken up more than 10 years ago at the highest levels of the center. After in initial informal discussions recently with the governor of Reserve Bank, we plan to revive this initiative shortly. According to the governor of the Reserve Bank, this initiative will save the national exchequer billions of dollars. So it is imperative that we move forward on this. Every month we bring out a newsletter. In the month of March, we brought out two newsletters. One was a regular issue, which highlights our discussions on the Municipal Corporation of Mumbai's budget. And the second was the V School Innovation Lab. These were in collaboration with the MIT Media Lab and various universities from across the world. These are the two newsletters that we have brought out, a hard copies of which have just come out. And if you're interested in a copy, please request the young lady at the entrance for a copy. And if we run out, please forward your email ID and we'll be happy to email an e-newsletter copy to you. Before I request Mr. Ashish Chauhan to introduce this magnificent institution, which is the oldest stock exchange in Asia, which of course does not need any introduction, I'd like to thank BSE, its chairman and its chief executive for hosting us this evening and hosting us month after month. Finally, I'd like to inform you that our subject for June will be police reforms. This is at the initiative of Mrs. Maya Daruwala, the daughter of Field Marshal Sam Maneksha, who incidentally would have celebrated his 100th birthday today. Maya has been working tirelessly on police reforms for several years, especially for the state of Maharashtra. She plans to open Amir Khan for this presentation, which will be in the first week of June. Once we zero in on the date, we'll be happy to inform you of the date. Our speaker for May is Dr. Isher Judge Aluwalia. This is on Friday, May 9th. She will speak on transforming our cities. And this, in addition to being in association with the collaborating chambers, we'll be also collaborating with Embark, IIT, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, TIST, We School, and UDRI <clears throat> for this event. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Ashish, may I request you now to introduce BSC and to introduce our star speaker for today. Thank you so much. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, BSC, as all of you know, is Bombay Stock Exchange, and this used to be the trading hall of BSC. Uh, it's basically uh, the largest exchange in the world in terms of number of stocks listed. More than 5,300 stocks are listed on BSC. I think the nearest uh, large stock exchange is around half the size of BSC in terms of the number of stocks listed. BSC is also uh, fourth largest exchange in the world in terms of the number of options traded, index options traded in the world, and uh, seventh largest in, the num in terms of number of uh, trades uh, per day, and so on and so forth. It's amongst uh, the fastest exchanges in the world with 200 microseconds response time. 
Uh, with that, I'll, I think I'll close uh, BS's introduction. Uh, what we have gathered today is for listening to uh, Tarun Ramdorai. Uh, Tarun is a professor of financial economics at the Said School of Said Business School, University of Oxford. His main areas of research interest include capital markets, international finance, household finance, and the Indian economy. He, pub he has published papers on these topics in leading international journals. Tarun is an executive committee member of the Oxford Mann Institute of Quantitative Finance, a senior academic fellow of the Asian Bureau of Finance and Economic Research, ABFER, and a research fellow of the Center for Economic Policy Research, CEPR. He is an economic advisor to the European Securities and Markets Authority, ESMA, and honorary advisor to the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, NIPFP, in New Delhi. During 2011-12, he was visiting scholar at the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India. Tarun has lectured extensively to audiences from the public and private sectors. He is routinely quoted in the media and has been involved with a range of executive education programs for organizations such as KPMG, ADIA, the Norwegian Government Pension Fund, the CFE Institute, and the Investment Management Consult Consultant Association. He has a BA in Mathematics and Economics from Williams College, an MPhil in Economics from the University of Cambridge, and a PhD in Business Economics from Harvard University. Uh, over to Mr. Tarun Ramdurai. Could we have the presentation up here? Okay. All right. Well, uh, thanks very much for having me over here um, to speak to all of you. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes? Okay. Excellent. So uh, my talk today is uh, about understanding the Indian stock market. This is probably a, a, a topic that's familiar to all of you, and this seems like quite, a, quite an appropriate venue to have this talk. Um, it's generally the case that if you want three opinions, you should ask two economists. And if you want ten opinions, you should ask one person in Bombay about what they think about the stock market, because they'll give you ten different opinions, depending on the time of day or whether they meet you in a good mood or in a bad mood, if their portfolio has been performing well, and so on and so forth. So, of course, this has motivated me to, to sort of learn a little bit more about the market and see whether we can try and replace opinions with some facts, um, and so this has been the product of a very large data gathering effort. So before I launch into the talk itself and tell you more about the research that we've been working on, maybe I can start by uh, telling you a little bit about how the field of finance itself has been changing over the years. So traditionally, the field of finance, if you went to, say, an MBA program somewhere, or even if you did undergraduate financial economics, You'd, you'd learn that it was separated into two big areas. One of them is called corporate finance, and the other one is called asset pricing. Now, corporate finance deals with the usual sorts of things that companies think about on a day-to-day -day basis. How do you raise capital? How do you do an initial public offering? Should I take debt or equity? Uh, and you might think about governments thinking about the same thing. Should I raise sovereign debt, for example? Uh, or how much debt is the appropriate level of debt? And so these, these are sort of corporate finance questions. Asset pricing deals with the study of once those securities are issued into the market, what are the prices of them and why are those prices determined the way they are, are those prices rational, and so on and so forth. Now, these have been the sort of traditional fields of finance, but very recently, there's been a new area in finance with a capital F, and, and this is o overall, and this area is called household finance. Now, the difference between corporate finance, asset pricing, and household finance is that in household finance, the unit of analysis is people like you and me when we're managing our investments and we're thinking about the big decisions that we might make. And, and make no mistake, all of us touch capital markets in this day and age when we're thinking about a mortgage, for example, or when we're investing in the equity market for retirement or for our pensions, uh, or even, for example, if you don't even participate in the formal financial market, through your employee provident fund, you're actually participating in the capital markets. And so household finance deals with the study of people like you and me, and the emphasis is on the fact that all of us tend to make huge mistakes from the perspective of finance theory when we're actually making decisions in these, in these markets. We make common mistakes, these mistakes can be very costly, and when you add it, add it up over your lifetime, this represents, generally speaking, a profit-making opportunity for someone who is not the household, which is a, usually a little bit of a problem. And this has come in for some scrutiny uh, in the financial crisis. 
Now, we're doing some work on this at Oxford. We have a an initiative sponsored by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation that connects us with Harvard, and the, we'd like to expand the study of household finance to think about emerging markets like our own, where hundreds of millions of people are moving into the, uh, the middle classes and having to make decisions where they deal with formal financial markets. So this is pro part of a broader re research agenda that we're engaged in. Now, I'd like to turn to something that's, that's much more the topic of, of what I want to speak about today, and, and that is about the fact that we're, we're in a place right now where we're trading, or you know, people have traded in the past, in this very room, risky assets. So stocks, for example, are the classic risky asset. Now, if you went to a finance textbook, um, textbook finance would tell you that holding stocks, regardless of who you are, as long as you have enough wealth to participate in the stock market, is actually a very sensible thing to do, because over the long run, you get a positive risk premium for investing in stocks. So in fact, I can write down a proof for you, based on ta classic textbook finance, that everyone in this room should be holding stocks as long as they are you know, a rational individual with some money that they have uh, that's, that's spare for them to invest. Now, of course, the problem between uh, sort of thinking about this in the theoretical setting and actually thinking about this in the real world is that when most, most of us actually do participate in these stock markets, we make a series of mistakes that undermine the benefits that we can actually have from participating in the stock market. Because we don't participate in the stock market the way the theory tells us to participate. So let me tell you about a few common mistakes that all of us tend to make, and I'll show you what the Indian population of investors, about which I have data, actually does. Okay? So the benefits are generally undermined by the following things. One of them is under-diversification, which is the fact that classically you should have just an index fund like the BSC or the NSC index, right? Um, but it turns out that most people under-diversify and hold maybe one or two stocks. I'll show you that the median holding in the Indian stock market is that the median investor, the most frequently held amount, is three and a half stocks on average. Okay? At the 10th percentile, the average individual holds one stock in their portfolio. Okay? So this is a huge problem because you're taking a massive amount of volatility without diversifying this away. You're putting all your eggs in one basket. The other problem that is very common is high turnover which is people tend to churn their portfolios extremely frequently when they trade because they're generally overconfident about their ability to time the market. Now, the one thing that happens to you when you churn your portfolio and you engage in high turnover is that you're constantly paying transactions costs to your broker. Now, I shouldn't be saying this in front of Ashish Chauhan, whose business is derived from this. It's a very good thing for him, but not necessarily an excellent thing for the average investor who should be trading less because the expected returns are uncertain, although the transactions costs that you pay to your broker are always very high in that situation. The third big problem is something called the disposition effect. And this is a tendency that all of us have in all aspects of life, but in, in particular in stock holdings, which is we tend to take our winning investments and sell them as soon as they have the slightest possible gain. But as soon as we have a losing investment, we hang on to it for a long time, hoping that the loss will somehow turn around. Now, in markets with positive momentum, of which the Indian market is one, where things that go up tend to go up and things that go down tend to keep going down, this is a serious losing proposition because you're holding on to your losers and you're selling your winners too early. That's known as the disposition effect in classic finance. And of course, the, th the fourth problem is just picking underperforming stocks. Okay? So we've known from decades of finance research that the right kinds of stocks to pick, all else equal, are small companies rather than very large companies. Okay? Um, are old economy companies rather than tech companies. I realize that there are people in this room who might not believe that for lots of reasons. Okay? Um, and are companies that have positive momentum, that is, share prices have been going up, they tend to continue to go up, at least over the short run. So if you picked underperforming stocks, that is, large companies, generally speaking, tech companies, generally speaking, companies that are, uh, have been going down in price rather than up, then you're likely to also lose some money while you're doing that. And these tend to be quite common tendencies for individual investors. Okay, now how can you help yourself in these situations when you're making these mistakes? So you could either delegate by going and giving money to a mutual fund manager, um, but of course there are problems there as well, because your mutual fund manager might charge you high levels of fees, your mutual fund manager might make the same mistakes as well, um, and so this might be a problem also. But of course there's another way you can do this, which is you can learn, right? So maybe you enter the stock market, you try out a few things, you burn your hands a few times, and then through the act of burning your hands, you actually learn to do much better. 
And maybe there are two types of learning, and those are the two we're going to consider. The first one is maybe you have some experience just by hanging around in the market for a period of time. And the other one is that you get some feedback from your investment performance. Okay? So how do you get feedback? You get feedback because if you do good behaviors, perhaps, okay, you do very well, your performance is good, that reinforces learning in the right direction. If you do certain things like trading certain kinds of stocks or reducing your turnover, maybe that then gives you feedback that that's the right thing to do and maybe people learn over time. Now, of course, learning can also go the wrong way. I mean, you know, uh, if you had a particularly good experience drinking alcohol in college, for example, you might be tempted to learn that drinking alcohol is an excellent behavior for you and that would be entirely the wrong lesson to pick up. And similarly, in stock trading, exactly the same thing can happen. You could learn that churning your portfolio very frequently is a good thing because you've just received some feedback randomly because of luck that that was a good thing to do. So let's take a look and see uh, what the Indian market actually looks like. Now, I should mention that we have excellent data on this. We're looking at something like 70% like of the Indian market. We have uh, data on something like 12 million investors, retail investors. We're seeing 68% of the entire market. We see these positions and these trades of these investors monthly. And this is in the entire Indian market, the NSE and the BSE and all of that, okay? So we're seeing 68% of all activity in the Indian market at the individual account level, at the individual security level, every month for over the last decade. So we're able to get very, very detailed information about these questions. And so I'm going to show you some of the results that we have about the, the way that the Indian market invests. So the first thing that you can see from this graph over here, it sort of starts from January 2004 and goes on until the end of January. And the black dotted line shows you how the Indian equity market has been performing over the period. So all of you know, for example, that up to October 2007, the market just kept going up. And then, of course, there was a, a sharp decline during the time of the financial crisis. And then there was a recovery um, up until the end of 2012, which is when our data set ends. The red line that you're seeing juxtaposed on top of that is the entrance into the Indian equity market, which is the number of investors that are basically uh, holding stock uh, in the Indian market. And you can see here that the, the scale on the left-hand axis goes up to about six million. Uh, but if you integrate that over the number of people who dropped out of the market and came in and, and left and so on, we have a total of about 11 million investors in this data sample. But the first thing you can see is that there's this very pronounced tendency for entry to be correlated with the returns on the stock market. When the stock market is doing well, people tend to get in, open new accounts, and decide that they're going to enter the stock market and participate. When the stock market collapses, you can see that basically the participation rate levels off. And so no new people tend to enter the market. People aren't exiting the market, but they just tend to sort of level off, and basically people don't, uh, don't leave the market at that point in time. That's sort of one of the broad findings. Now, let me show you a, a few statistics. For those of you who are afraid of numbers, please don't worry. I'll, I'll talk you through all, all of these things very carefully. Um, so what, what the, the top panel shows you is just what our data looks like. So what this tells you is that from 2004 to 2012, which is the period of our analysis, we look at investments in about 6,000 stocks total. So the BSC has about 3,500 stocks, but there have been companies that are born and then died. So we look at a total over the period of about 6,000 different companies. That's the number of investments uh, that people can make. The total market capitalization on average in the Indian stock market that our data covers is six, about 63%, which is substantial because that accounts for about $700 billion worth of investment. The Indian market capitalization now is on the order of $1.5 trillion, but over the, over the years we've seen about $700 billion, and those are the results I'm showing you now. Of which we're going to concentrate on the retail investor segment, that is direct investments by people like you and me, uh, and which is about 12.8% uh, of the market cap uh, of the 63.63. So we're, we're focusing on something like $80, $80 billion worth of investments right now. That's, that's what we're, we're talking about. The number of accounts, as I said, is 11.6 million over the period. Now, a few statistics about the people that we're looking at. So the amounts that people are investing in the stock market basically range on average from about the, the sort of at the 10th percentile. So sort of the smaller investors are investing about 7,000 rupees of their savings in the stock market. At the median, we're talking about 67,000, 68,000 rupees is the average investment over their lifetimes. And then at the 90th percentile, there are some very wealthy people, and so the 90th percentile investment is about five and a half lakhs. Of course, if you moved it up all the way up to the 98, 99th percentile, now we're talking crores, okay? But all of those people are in our data. 
Now, the staggering thing is in the next line, which shows you that at the 10th percentile, so 10%, fully 10% of the people who are in the, in the market are holding one stock, only one stock in their portfolios, okay? If I go all the way up to the 50th percentile, which is 50% of the people in the sample, we're talking three and a half stocks or less in their portfolios. This is massive under-diversification. Classic textbook finance tells you that you should be holding an index portfolio, but that's not what's happening in the Indian market. At the 90th percentile, you might think that things are better. You're only getting to about 14 stocks in the portfolio. The theoretical benefits of diversification only kick in when you have about 30 stocks in your portfolio. So you're only halfway there at the 90th percentile. Now this translates into performance differentials along with the other behaviors. At the 10th percentile, so the people at the 10th percentile or below, are underperforming the Indian stock market index by 21% a year, okay? So if they held the index, rather than holding the portfolio that they're holding, they would do 21% per annum better on the money that they've got invested in the stock market. The average Indian retail, or the median Indian retail investor is underperforming the market by about 1.5% per annum. Doesn't seem like much, but if you compound that over long periods of time, that really kicks in to huge amounts of money. Now, of course, the interesting thing is at the 90th percentile, there are guys who are outperforming the Indian stock market by 18%, and that's the focus of this talk, which is, why is there such a big difference? Is that experience? Is that learning? Are there guys who are coming in as retail investors, sticking around for a while, and really figuring out how to, how to do things in the market? Now, just one other thing I want to highlight from here. So there's the idiosyncratic share, which is basically another measure of portfolio uh, under-diversification. So at the 10th percentile, the idiosyncratic share is very low. People are quite diversified. At the 90th percentile, idiosyncratic share is high, which means people are very under-diversified. What this tells you is most of the volatility is not coming from, uh, from total index volatility. Most of the volatility in your portfolio is coming from the fact that you're holding random small stocks or stocks that are not in the index. The turnover is also interesting. So this is the churn that I was talking about. The median Indian investor, retail investor, is turning over their portfolio, a third of their portfolio, selling a third of the stocks in their portfolio and buying new stocks. But at the 90th percentile, the investors who are churning their portfolios are selling all of the stocks in their portfolios twice over. So if you had held 10 stocks, then you sold all of those stocks, bought another 10, sold all of those stocks, bought another 10 in one year's time. Think about the bonanza for the brokers in terms of the transactions cost that you're paying when you do that, okay? All right. The disposition effect tells you that at the 90th percentile, investors are nine times more likely to sell a winning investment than they are to sell a losing investment, okay? So this is a very substantial amount. If you have a losing investment in your portfolio, you're nine times more likely to hang on to it, whereas if it's a winning investment, nine times more likely to sell it at the 90th percentile. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit about learning, which is the, 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 the topic of my talk. So let's go to turnover, which is this business of churning your portfolio. So we've looked at the entire Indian group of 11.6 million investors. And what we find is this is very good news because it shows you that your tendency to churn your portfolio is dramatically reducing over time. So this is the cohort of investors who started in December 2003. And what we do is, in our model, we calculate what happens to them on account of just being around in the market and the feedback that they receive from their trading in their portfolio. Now, what that top panel over there shows you, the orange line, which is the center line between those two things, is that for an investor who doesn't really receive any feedback, um, so we've shut down all, all sources of feedback from the investment performance that they've received, as they get older and older, from December 2003 all the way out to 2011, 2012, which is the end of our sample, they basically tend to reduce the amount they churn their portfolio until the point at which, by the end of the sample period, once they're eight-year-old investors in the stock market, they basically churn their portfolios 80% less than when they first began. So what this is saying is, by sheer dint of just being in the market, one of the nice things that tends to happen is people learn, and they learn that churning your portfolio, the only thing you do is you enrich your broker, and by the end of the sample, 80% less churn is what happens here. Now, what are the two lines around that? The two lines around that tell you that the fact of your experiences matter a lot. The top one, the, the dark brown line, shows you that if you actually did quite well by churning your portfolio, if it turns out that you performed well and you thought that this is because your trading style was particularly good and churning your portfolio was a good thing to do, much, much slower. So by the end of the period, 
you're only 60% uh, reduction in your portfolio churn because you somehow felt like you were the greatest thing in the world because you've been performing very well. We've all met these people at cocktail parties, right? Or at a, when you're having chai with someone. And they'll tell you, boss, my trading style is the best in the world. It's really fantastic. I do extremely well. These are the guys who learn slow, okay? So next time you see someone like that, you should have a little chuckle to yourself because you know that these are not really the guys who are doing the good stuff, okay? The guys at the bottom, um, if you look at the 90th percentile of feedback there, are the guys who learn quickest. And the reason that they learn quickest is because they've had bad experiences early on. And having bad experiences early on, paradoxically, can be the best possible thing that ever happened to you because it makes you learn much faster to avoid bad behaviors. Okay? So if you're going to stumble, you should stumble early in your career as a stock market investor is what this is telling you. The disposition effect also tends to reduce over a period of time. So your tendency to uh, sell your winning investments and hold on to your losing investments dramatically declines over a period of time as well. But paradoxically, the amount of under-diversification that you engage in slightly actually creeps up over a period of time. So it's almost as though as investors get older and older over a period of time, they learn that there are certain types of stocks they like specializing in, and they just tend to concentrate their portfolios in those stocks rather than diversifying their portfolios. Okay. Now, what I want to do is just talk about three quick investment styles, um, which, which are investments in small stocks, which is good for you, investments in value stocks or old economy companies, also good for you in the Indian market, and investments in high momentum stocks, which is companies that have performed quite well, also a good thing to do in the Indian market. And what happens to these things, again, as a result of your learning over a period of time? So again, if you look at the same sort of plots that we've seen before, the median person learns over a period of time as they get older and older that investing in stocks is a good thing, in small stocks is a good thing. And you can see that their tendency to invest in small stocks is something like 25% greater than a perpetual rookie investor over the period. So they do start investing in small stocks. The good news is that people who receive feedback about small stocks increase their holdings of small stocks at an even faster rate. And that's the top blue line. Whereas people who didn't actually receive that kind of feedback about small stocks learn very, very slowly, and at the end of the sample period, over eight years, they're only holding something like 10% more small stocks than they otherwise would have. You see exactly the same patterns with value stocks, but they're much more extreme. You can see that people tend to hold old economy companies much, much more frequently. We're talking about 100% more frequently than a perpetual rookie investor by the end of the sample. This is in the 11.6 million uh, uh, population of Indian investors. So there is a sense in which getting older does make you much wiser in this dimension. And that's true regardless of the feedback you receive. Although if you received good feedback, you were lucky enough to do that, you're much more aggressive about doing these behaviors. In momentum, the picture is a bit more mixed. Um, it tends to be the case that People generally become more contrarian as they get older, but there are some people who've received good feedback about momentum, and then they basically start buying winners and selling losers, which is what you should be doing in the Indian market. Okay. So you might say, well, this is all about behavior, right? You've told me that these guys have stopped reducing their turnover and all of this kind of stuff, and they've sort of reduced their turnover. They've started investing in better things. But does this actually benefit them in terms of the bottom line at the end of the day? Do people make more money by engaging in good behavior in the Indian stock market? And the answer is yes. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to show this to you in only one way by showing you this one picture over here. Now, this picture shows you the performance of the Indian stock market from January 2004 all the way to the end of the sample period, which is the end of 2012. The black line in the center is just the BSE Sensex, the total return that you would have made from a one rupee investment in the BSE Sensex starting in 2004, held until the end of 2012. Now, obviously, if you had sold out sometime in 2007, you would have done spectacular, spectacularly well. You would have made about three and a half times your money, but not everybody was lucky enough to, to time the market in that fashion. Uh, but by the end of the sample, you've made something like 1.75 or two, two rupees for every one rupee that you've invested. The bottom yellow line is novice investors in the Indian stock market. When they first came in, what we do is we track the portfolios of people who've just come into the Indian stock market. So if you followed the behavior of the average novice investor in the Indian stock market every month, you actually tend to lose a slight amount of money by the end of something like eight to 10 years of being in the market relative to just holding the index, which would have resulted in you doing much, much better. 
But the interesting thing is that the more experienced people, so if you look at the performance of a five-year-old investor, that's basically the dashed blue line, and you see that those guys are actually doing slightly better than holding the index. So there is some element of learning that allows you to become even better than an investor that is simply holding the index by just sticking around in the market. So one thing that this tells you is that the best form of investor education is actually being in the market for a long period of time. If you are in the market for a long period of time, this tells you that you're actually becoming an educated investor, both by the feedback that you receive as well as by the fact that you've just been in that environment and you've understood a little bit more about how to trade stocks. Now, why do these guys outperform? It turns out that they favor small companies, old economy companies. They favor companies that don't have high levels of turnover. They also don't like companies that are promoter-driven companies. So older and more experienced investors tend to stay away from companies that have large block holdings of greater than 5% from any given promoter-driven uh, organization. So there is something there which might be a corporate governance perspective that these people are taking. The older they are, the more experienced they are in the market. They also avoid large initial public offerings, which is a very sensible thing to do in India. I know that people in India are all about getting participation in the IPO market, but if you want to lose money, then please invest in an IPO, because that is the quickest way to invest in an IPO, to, to lose money in the Indian stock market. A lot of this is coming from the fact that there are rookie mistakes. It's not coming from the fact that older investors are somehow um, uh, simply just getting better and better over time. It's also the case that the newbies are making all kinds of errors when they're investing. But there is some special sauce that the investors who have been around for a while actually have, and they're doing very well as a result of that. Now, it's also the case, and this is very interesting, that if you look at Indian stocks, which have investors that are experienced, don't churn their portfolios very much, have large stocks in their portfolios, and have value stocks in their portfolios, those companies themselves tend to inherit the characteristics of their investors, and they tend to outperform over a period of time. So that, I think, is a particularly interesting finding, which says that as there are more and more experienced individuals in the Indian capital markets, it seems like, in some sense, they're making the market environment a bit better, and so those companies tend to deliver high expected returns. Okay, so to conclude, feedback and experience seem very important for behavior and ultimately Indian uh, stock market investor returns. Investment skill seems to develop over time, but early good performance in your investments is actually a very bad thing, okay? So it encourages bad behavior. So if you're going to do badly, early is the time to, to make your mistakes because it tends to benefit you in the long run. If you're more interested in the findings in this paper, uh, it's available at this website. This is my website. Um, and the paper is called Getting Better or Feeling Better, um, How uh, Equity Investors Learn from Investment Experience. We're also now working on a lot of other questions using this data. One of them is social network effects in investing. If your neighbor buys a certain stock, are you more likely to buy this stock? If you live in a neighborhood which has a company that is headquartered there, are you more likely to buy that company? Answers generally tend to be yes. And we're also looking at reactions to personal shocks and aggregate shocks. So if there's a corporate governance fraud in the market, does it make everybody withdraw from a whole bunch of companies? What are the effects on the market quality and so on and so forth? So this is the overall research agenda. So I'm happy to take questions, but thanks very much for listening to me. Ashish had the magic touch. Uh, questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to compliment you on your excellent work. I think it's, uh, it's uh, shown some real good conclusions. Uh, my question to you is, um, have you done some work on the Western world where a lot of the retail investors go through the mutual fund route vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Asian economy, especially India, and to some extent Korea also, which is uh, which like to directly expose? So is there any difference in findings? And uh, do you see a trend because now the mutual fund industry in India is kind of picking up? So do you see any change in behavior uh, with people now moving more into the mutual fund route? So um, thanks. Can you, this is working, right? So yeah. 
Thanks very much. That's, that's a great question. One of the reasons why we're able to study things like diversification in the Indian market is because mutual fund penetration in India has historically been extremely low. So looking at direct stock investments by retail investors is actually meaningful in an environment where the mutual fund share is quite low. In many other markets, of course, people invest a lot through mutual funds as opposed to just through stocks. Now, it turns out that that does tend to improve the overall investment performance of investors because they're getting diversification and so on and so forth. But there's another layer of problems that they then have to confront, which is choosing fees appropriately, which is what is the right level of fees in these funds. And the second problem they get into is performance chasing behavior. So you always see this guide that past performance is not necessarily a guide to future performance. Well, in the rest of the world, and you know, emerging markets are slightly different, past performance is a guide to future performance, but it's only bad past performance by mutual funds that tends to be followed by bad past performance in the future for those same mutual funds. And it tends to be the case that investors generally just chase performance. So this is another issue that people are dealing with. There's excellent evidence from Finland where they're able to track IQ scores of people because they take tests in going into the military. And they show that IQ levels, rather controversially, are correlated with your propensity to pick high fee funds. So if you have a low IQ level, you're much more likely to pick a high IQ, to pick a high fee fund. You also generally tend to, to, to make bad decisions in terms of their future expected performance and so on and so forth. So it, it's, I mean, the overall message here is that there is a role for regulation and that role for regulation must be to educate the investor population because there's a lot of mistakes that people can make in the kinds of investment decisions that they make. Learning is helpful here and that's a good thing, but it takes a while for that to happen. So if we can accelerate that process, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you a question, is to get uh, feedback from you, is to, what is your perception of our stockbrokers in terms of developing shareholders, which I think over a period of time, over a period of time, I find that our uh, stockbrokers really are not playing that kind of active role which they should. I don't know how, whether there's any surveys on it or you have some experience perhaps of the US market, that how proactive are they in this, and particularly in India, where knowledge is low on that, so do you think that that could help or in terms of developing the market? Sure. So that, that's another great question. So it turns out that, um, so it, if you think about it uh, without thinking about this issue too carefully, you might say that the incentives for the average broking organization is actually to have a relatively underdeveloped market where people don't understand these things very well. And if they don't understand these things very well, then they're going to churn their portfolios, they're going to make all these kinds of errors, and that will actually benefit brokers. But if you think about it a little bit more carefully, you'll realize that that's not quite the case. Because one of the big issues in investor participation in stock markets all around the world is an issue of trust. So one thing we know is that trust is highly correlated with stock market participation. If increases in trust tend to generate huge increases in people's propensity to invest in formal savings mechanisms. So for example, one of the things that the Indian government is struggling with right now is investments in gold, which is an unproductive investment, relative to investments in the actual market or in other productive investments. Now if you improve the level of trust, you'll have a huge volume of savings moving across from informal mechanisms like gold to formal mechanisms that are more productively channeled like the stock market. Now of course the problem is that this is a classic public goods issue. If I'm a broker who is improving investment quality, in the short run, I'm going to lose business relative to my other competitors. In the long run, everybody benefits, but maybe I don't see as much of that in terms of my private benefit. So if it's a classic public goods problem, then there's a role for regulation to step in and address that market failure. So it seems to be the case that someone has to come in and actually improve the quality of investor education, and maybe then there's a role for regulation. Yeah, over here. 
Sir, in your study, have you considered the shareholding in physical form, even today out of the lot of stocks listed on the BSE? Quite a few stocks are even not dematable as of day. And secondly, I mean the propensity of people to move their account, because earlier you had these brokerages charging 2 and 2 and a percent. Now people are charging 0.1 percent or 0.2 percent. So there's been a lot of movement of old investors, which you may have counted as new investors. Have you considered that in your study, sir? So this is a, a, another great question. So yes, we've confronted that measurement challenge. Uh, it turns out that there are sources uh, from which you can look at. So the Center for Monitoring the Indian Economy tracks the percentage of shares in any given company at the quarterly frequency that are in electronic or dematted form versus those that are in physical form. And we are looking at data at the moment from the National Securities Depository, but we are also in the process of acquiring data from the Central uh, Depository Services Limited. It turns out that if you add up the shares that we have in electronic dematted form, for most companies, we are getting up to a 99.5% of the shareholding base of the company over the sample period that we have, which is 2002 to the present. So that's not an issue for something like 90% of the market that we consider. For some of the companies that we consider, it is the case that there is still physical holdings of securities. In some cases, there are also examples in which there's movements between the physical and the electronic. For the purposes of our study, we're not considering that for the moment, but it tends to be a relatively smaller segment of the market. So we're not so worried that this is affecting our inferences that we're talking about here. And when we talk about entry, we're actually talking about new accounts rather than dematting. We've been very careful to check that against the, uh, the depositories as well. Thank you. Yes, there's one more hand going up there. A uh, couple of questions. What I picked up from your presentation, three, four suggestions you have given. One is that uh, diversify. Second is avoid trading, which you have indirectly put the high turnover. So don't trade your portfolio too often or churn it too often. S sorry, I didn't catch that second. First suggestions you've given yeah. that do diversification. Okay. Don't stick to one stocks. And second, you said avoid trading. Means don't go high turnover and you think that you'll do better in every stocks. Correct. One observation or some questions to basically, would an investor be better off instead of going to the broader market if he specifics a sector, say banks or IT, or wherever he has some uh, confidence that this sector will perform better, will that his return be better off than the going for overall market? And secondly, do you have any suggestions on the entry point, I know it is always difficult to uh, time the market, but if you look at the investors who had entered at 2008, today from 2008, peak level for today, the return may be 10%, but if he has invested one year back, his return may be 50%. you have any suggestion from that entry point? Or also should he makes a, uh, may, uh, make a mix between the date and equity? Some portion of the date, some portion of the equity, and any relevance to the age of the person? Okay, so the first question is about whether you can specialize in certain sectors where you feel like you have more information. Now, it turns out that the problem is feeling like you have any information. So, so let me be a little bit more specific. The, the, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And it's especially the case in the stock market that a little knowledge is a very dangerous thing. Because what it tends to do is it makes you overconfident to, in the following sense. You see something and you get what's known as confirmation bias. This is a standard issue in psychology. You see pieces of information that confirm your hypothesis. You think that they're credible. You see pieces of information that run contrary to your hypothesis. You think they come from a source from a guy who doesn't know anything. That's generally the problem when you tend to have this level of... Now, the way to avoid that is to just diversify across all sectors of, of the economy, okay? So what you really want to be participating in when you're holding the stock market is the long-run growth prospects of Indian cash flows of Indian firms across the board, which is only something that's going to come by the overall performance of the Indian economy. Now, to the extent that you can make returns from specialization, you should tilt your portfolio towards small stocks, towards companies that have done quite well recently, 
and towards companies that are old economy rather than new economy companies because we've known for long periods of time from many markets around the world, including our own, that investments in small stocks, value stocks, and high momentum stocks tend to deliver higher expected returns than average. So those are good things to do. Now, of course, you don't have to go and synthesize that yourself. There are going to be mutual fund managers who specialize in exactly those kinds of things. Ideally, don't go to a mutual fund manager, get an index fund manager, a low-cost index provider that doesn't charge you fees and doesn't claim that they have expertise, because expertise is very hard to find. Your second question was a question about timing the stock market. Another case in which it's virtually impossible and academics have tried for generations. There are movies about this. If you want to see this movie called Pi, that'll tell you more about this kind of thing. People have been fascinated with the concept of predicting the stock market. It's possible in some particular states of the world over long periods of time, if you tilt your head in exactly the right way and believe the statistical evidence, to think that there's a smidgen of evidence about timing. But for the average investor, there's no evidence about timing at all. Trying to time the market is a very difficult thing and you probably shouldn't be trying to do it. The thing you should be doing is getting into the market. The worst thing you can do is not participate. Trying to figure out the right time to get in, it just delays the fact that you're going to get into the market and you're going to miss out on the expected returns over the period. So buy an index fund, tilt your portfolio, and forget about it. Best thing you can do is invest in the market and forget about your investments for a period of time. In developed market, people goes for uh, passive funds. Uh, in the emerging market, people go for active funds. It is because of experience. Um, okay, so so it turns out that the evidence on mutual fund performance in developed markets and emerging markets is a little bit different. It turns out that if you go to the developed markets, going for passive funds is a smart thing to do because there's very little evidence that mutual funds are able to outperform passive index funds. In emerging markets, things are slightly different because of the fact, partly, that the retail investor base is not as well developed, that makes space for the mutual fund managers to make money. Because the only way to make money in a capital market is at somebody else's expense, really. I mean, it's, it's very, very difficult. It's a zero-sum game. I can prove this to you. And it turns out that if you have unsophisticated investors, they create the space for sophisticated investors. So there is still some evidence now in emerging markets that a little bit of investment in mutual funds is not a bad thing to do because they do have evidence of performance. But overall, if you can find a passive fund, you should go for a passive fund. That's the smart thing to do. Yeah, uh, given uh, your research, it looks as if uh, India, Indian investors churn a lot. Uh, given uh, the preponderance of the television channels uh, who tend to think that one hour is a long-term investment, <laughs> uh, do you think we have 2020 and now probably 5-5 five, five or something like that uh, in at least uh, stock markets, not in cricket, but so uh, do you think it's going to be churning more going forward or… Uh, so this is, this is a great question. I mean, th that is right. Now, one of the things that's a very active area of investigation now is what is the role of the media and what is the role of supply side factors in getting people to enter the market? Now, I, I think one of the things that's, uh, uh, that I would say is that the more churn there is by retail investors, the more space it creates for entry of big, sophisticated players to come in. And one of the patterns we've seen in many capital markets around the world is increasing institutionalization of investment, and that's true in our market as well. Certainly in our data sample, the proportion of individual investors that we see has gone from 17% to about 9% by the end of our sample, so it's also the case that retail investment is shrinking in our market. If that's the case, then churn basically reduces because institutional investors, generally speaking, tend to churn their portfolios less. Now, of course, if there are hedge funds that enter and so on and so forth, then we're going to see a slightly different uh, scenario evolving. But I would imagine that there will be a secular decline in churn per investor, but the number of investors is going to rise. So overall volumes are going to increase over time. That's my thought. The other issue was that um, this is only related to the equities. Uh, if you take the derivatives, now derivatives account for probably 90, 95% of the total volumes, uh, would you have uh, sort of additional uh, sort of observations to make that Indian market now 
is largely uh, trade driven rather than investment driven? So I'd love to get my hands on the FNO data. Um, the futures and options data would be absolutely terrific to look at. Um, we've been asked this question before. I mean, of course, it is the case that if I'm looking at single stock futures or index futures, that um, if they cash settled, of course, there doesn't have to be a link to the underlying, and so that's something that you know one might see. But our focus in this effort is much more investment rather than trading, and we're trying to characterize the behavior of investment in the Indian market. But you're that if there's a massive volume of trade that's going on in those markets that we don't see, we're in some sense missing something about the average investor. Now, what I would say is that what we're seeing here is probably a lower bound on the value destruction that is going on in the Indian markets because if we were to see futures and options, we'd probably see that the average retail investor who was running an FNO portfolio as well was destroying more value in their FNO portfolio than they are in their investment so portfolio. So leading to that, basically the question, if I rephrase it, uh, earlier, say 20 years back or even 10 years back, investors will come into the stock market, some of them will have good experience and then lose money later on and some of them will have bad ex experience and they will not come to the market and some of them will still come and make money. But because uh, the derivatives are even much faster zero-sum game with Avi, mm -hmm. uh, the equities, right. uh, do you believe that uh, the new investor is now going into that, losing money fast and then not coming out and then new, come, new ones come and then they lose money fast and they go out and so you have no new additions because we have not seen uh, I mean, I think the number of people investing in Indian stock market has more or less remained same for last 20 years. So, I mean, I was just curious to figure that are we just getting people out of the door very fast or not? So, so this is a great question. Most people tend to think that the people who leave capital markets, especially the Indian capital market, are those that have lost money and then exit the market. It turns out that what we see in our data is an extreme form of the disposition effect, which is exactly the opposite. People who make big gains tend to exit the market almost instantaneously. It's almost like you go to Las Vegas, you bet on black, you make a lot of money, and then you say, I'm never coming back to Las Vegas again. Okay? Whereas the people who tend to stick around in the market that we've observed are the losers. So this is an extreme form of the disposition effect. When people lose money, they tend to stick around hoping that at some point, if they keep betting more, double down on the losing investment, that somehow this is going to come good for them at some point in the future. Now, if this behavior that we're seeing in the equity market is anything to go by, then I would say that the FNO market is likely to be populated by the people who've actually suffered cumulative losses. And the fact that you're not seeing additional entry is because people are not seeing the possibility of large gains. And maybe that's what's going on. Thank you so much. It's not very often that the Q&A session is as exciting as the main presentation. So, Tarun, thank you so much. And let's give him a warm round of applause in appreciation. And now may I ask Nandan Maluste, my colleague in Bombay First, who's the Sec Honorary Secretary and Treasurer, to provide the concluding remarks and the vote of thanks. Nandan. Well, as Roger has already said, um, Ex extremely interesting presentation by Tarun and an even better, if possible, Q&A session. And uh, I suppose we should not just thank Tarun for that, but each and every one of you. So um, thank you for that. Secondly, we, of course, we must uh, thank Tarun for coming all the way from Oxford to speak to us this evening. And uh, lastly, of course, uh, the Bombay Stock Exchange. Thank you very much for hosting this. All the best. And the manner of speaking, the bar is open, I think.